So um, I'm going to start just by mentioning a couple things. First of all, I have started putting the lectures on, they'll be in the stream. And where I think about it and it makes sense, I'll put them attached to the appropriate assignment. So like uh, Tuesday's class, I put on sampling homework number two. So right, well, we talked about a Tuesday, it doesn't help the homework that's due tomorrow, today. Today, tomorrow? Today. Um, <clears throat> I remember we moved it back, but yeah, to today. But I did put it right there. So if you click on it, it should take you right to my video. Um, and I skipped it ahead to 15 minutes because um, remember the first 15 minutes, all we talked about was the weather and well, the candidates coming and stuff. So 15 minutes in is where we start talking about stratified sampling. The whole video is there if you do want to watch as the little pop up pops up and tells us we don't have a class yesterday. Um, and so you can do that. And what I was just showing you, I guess you can see that it, um, Google wants to keep it in the native viewer, um, which is little like this, but if you'd rather open it in the big YouTube window, you can just click on that. Um, and I do have to say, since we didn't really have a lot of time and I wasn't here yesterday, I didn't go through and edit it. So like the captions, which I think are actually kind of cool that it captions it. Normally I would go through and fix it. So like many tabs is what it calls mini tabs. Many tabs. Um, and when I mention this, the language R, it always writes O-U-R. Because if I say do it an hour, you know, that doesn't make any sense. But um, anyway, but it's still pretty cool. I think that it does that and computers are magic. And we can talk about how that works later. Um, that's a different stat class, but it does use probabilistic models Woo! to do that. So um, anyway, you can watch that too. You can't see here we are talking and then boom, it pops up on the screen. We don't have school. So anyway, you can watch that. Um, and I think it's pretty straightforward. It just puts a little, little cameras up here in the corner and the video is right there. So um, I think you'll You'll like that. And if you do have to miss class for some reason, you know, that's better than nothing. You probably still do want to get the notes from somebody. But I think that does make it a little bit easier to follow. So, that, that, um, so um, in other news, remember your labs are all uh, coming in here. Um, uh, remember I talked about the uh, bonus labs, so the SPSS lab zero. I think one you might just do um, just so you get a taste of how SPSS works. We're going to use it a little bit later. It's five uh, participation points or whatever I call them, the extra points that you do. Google Sheets lab one, I don't recommend you do because it's a really basic here's how spreadsheets work lab. Um, so if you know what the dollar sign is and you know if you grab a little box in the corner and you drag it, you're already too advanced to do that one. Um, but it's five points, but you could probably get five, you know, coming to here, a candidate talk is, I think, an easier five points than that. Yep. So tomorrow's candidate is coming at two o'clock for their research talk. And uh, I never did forward that email. I'll forward that email to everybody, um, or I'll post it on the stream. Um, when I post it on the stream, do you get an email about that? Yeah. Okay. So I'll try to not do that too often, but um, I will do that. You can actually go into settings and change that if it's spamming you. Um, but yeah, so two o'clock tomorrow is their research talk, which is about R and stuff. Um, and then their teaching talk is at 3.30. And that's the one I'd, I'd extra like people to go to. And that's in 12.04 at 3.30. Cause that's the one we don't have scheduled for a regular class. Um, Mondays is also at 3.30, but that's in a regular Stat 190 class. So it's less of a crisis if you can't go to that one. Um, but anyway, I'll email that all out to you. Um, Cause we do have all those candidates coming. Yep. And all we have to do is like show up yeah, listen. Show up and listen and, you know, fill out the little rating form. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so. Be polite. Um, so, yeah, so if you can come to that tomorrow, that'd be great. And I will forward that email out. Um, He's on his airplane right now, so hopefully he, he lands. Uh, English actually had a candidate scheduled yesterday, so I have no idea what they did because campus was closed. Person flew in, so. Sorry. And then I mentioned the third extra credit, or not extra credit, the, extra, the class assignment, which is that you would make a lab. And again, that's a little bit more detailed. I'm not sure all of you would want to do that, but I think actually that process of trying to 
write down how you would explain something to somebody else. I feel like that's a really good way for you to learn it yourself. So if you feel totally unconfident, maybe that's not something you want to do because it'll freak you out. And if you're super confident already, then maybe it won't teach you any deeper understanding. But if you're somewhere in the middle, I feel like that a proper that process of just writing out things as though you were going to explain them. I think that's a great way to do that. And we'll have several of those throughout the semester. And again, they're worth a ton of points. So if you can't or you think going to visit candidates isn't fun, uh, that's totally fine. Um, I think I mentioned in all there's there'll be definitely more points than you'd ever want to get in that column by the time we're done. So cool. All right. And I did hit record, right? Yes. Speaking of speaking of recording the lecture. All right. So previously we were talking about the stratified uh, worksheet and stratified sampling in general. So you remember last time um, we were talking, and a big part of this is just keeping track of the notation. And you remember I used a little w uh, to represent the sample fraction, which is the proportion of your sample from each of the subgroups. So if your group is 30% freshmen, little w sub freshmen would be 0.3. Your population fraction is the proportion of your population that do that. So in that sample I was showing you, the proportion of our sample was like 60% freshmen. So little w would have been 0.6. But in truth, freshmen are about 30% of our campus, a little bit more than a quarter. Um, so capital W would be 0.3 or whatever it is. And this idea that if the two are the same, then simple random sample and stratified random samples are going to be identical looking because all you've really done is a crazy complicated way of doing random samples. Where stratified sampling is going to be better is where you feel like these capital W's, your sense of the population fraction, is going to be better than what you would get from chance by itself. So in a sense it might even be more random or more representative than a simple random sample especially if you feel like there could be some flaws in your sampling design. That if we just took people from the health and wellness class, for instance, we're going to oversample freshmen. Okay, speaking of notation, um, then the formulas for stratified sampling aren't really harder than our regular confidence interval. Certainly this is basically our confidence interval formula, except it has x bar st and s squared st. Um, just inside the fraction. Um, like that. So um, this idea that all we're doing is this weighted average of the mean and this weighted average of the variance. Right? Remember variance is just standard deviation squared. Um, so and I wrote it wrong all three times. Man, I suck. All right. Fortunately, I pointed to that Wikipedia page and it always has the formulas right, usually. Um, so this idea though that arithmetically this can get really complicated. The ones we're doing have, you know, we're talking about men and women as two strata, or we're talking about freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. That's four strata, right? That's enough that I can mess up the formula. In lots of real cases, you're going to have 30 strata or 100 strata, you know, so if you imagine now we're going to stratify by major. Well, we have 40 programs on campus, some we switch together, like the BA and BS in statistics, we always think of them as a single unit. But, you know, 40 majors. So would you stratify into 40? Well, you need 40 of those columns in your spreadsheet. And, you know, now forgetting the formulas, at least your problem, if you were going to do that by hand. And in fact, in practice, up until the 90s, people really didn't stratify with more than about four categories in a real way, unless you were really working in a, um, some very deep um, high computing, because a local computer really couldn't solve it. And you know, you guys tend to think that a spreadsheet gives you instantaneous results, right? If you change something in Excel, it. But 20 years ago, even in a spreadsheet, if you had it set up, if you had 20 categories, changing the data would take you know five or 10 minutes or longer for the data to all update and the formulas to change their output. And so. Now, I mean, computers aren't perfect and they aren't magic, but they're fast enough that now we really do think of them as sort of instantaneously calculating things like this. All right, so let me just remind you of our story here. So you remember our story was, this is the spring 2004 health survey. 
It was administered in uh, the Health 195 class, whatever the old class was, the, the brick and mortar one, not the online one. Um, and we had all these questions about health, about uh, drinking, about other substance abuse, about a whole bunch of things. We're going to use this data set throughout the semester. It's old enough that we can have access to it, but it's still sort of close enough that you can totally imagine where it's coming from. So it's a nice, useful, it's also sort of a nice size with about 600 respondents in it. Um, okay, it's in SPSS in its raw form because that's what they use to analyze it. Um, but for right now, we're going to just use this stratified worksheet. So again, the question that we had here on this simple means worksheet was, um, in the last two weeks, no, in an average two weeks, how many drinks do you have? Let me check the question because that sort of is important. And I don't have the exact wording, but. Average number, so it is average number of drinks per week. Um, this is the bin set that's implemented. So in a typical week, how many drinks do you have on average? And again, there's that formula for a beer or a glass of wine or a shot of hard liquor. And when we smushed it all together in a simple way, we got 5.36 as the average. When we split it up by the four classes, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, we added the stratification adjustment, which was that 60% of our sample were freshmen, but only 31% of Truman students were freshmen. And the other way, only 8% of our sample were juniors, but 21% of the student body are juniors, right? So it sort of inflates and deflates the different groups so that they now have an importance equal to not the little w's, which is what happens organically if you treat it as a regular sample, but we use the big w's instead. Math, math. Um, it remembers to do the square that I forgot to put in the formula, which is why computers are nice. And then we got the confidence intervals for each A or for each uh, class. So freshmen on average have an average of 4.72 drinks, plus or minus 0.27. Notice that juniors, because the sample size is so much smaller, the standard deviation is a little bigger, but it's mainly that square root of 43 instead of square root of 340. You can see that this is a much bigger, that's plus or minus 0.27 drinks. This is plus or minus 0.65. Also, you'll notice that freshmen do, on average, drink less than sophomores, juniors, or seniors from our study. Right, and again, that's not the purpose of stratified random sampling, to get those subpopulation intervals, but you get them for free. Like, while you're here, now you know about each of your subgroups. And you can imagine studies about uh, different kinds of customers, about different kinds of patients, about different sorts of products that you produce, having the data separately will in and of itself be useful to have, as well as the overall, right? We want to know our overall, I don't know, in the hospital mortality rate, right? How, how many of our patients are surviving a year after their treatment? But you might want to split that down by the different subcategories and conditions that you're interested in. And even within a particular, I mean, I guess certainly, you would expect those to be different on different floors of the hospital. The maternity ward hopefully has a higher survival than the cancer wing. But even within different treatments within the same condition, having these substrata, these subpopulation intervals is really awesome to have. Okay, from this uh, formula though, we also get then this overall confidence interval, which there's the one uh, from the simple random sample, 4.7 to 6.63. And instead, we get this slightly higher one that we can use uh, to get a slightly more useful or accurate result. Again, arithmetically, it's annoying. Theoretically, it's not actually that hard, right? It's just a weighted average of your subgroups smushed together in a thoughtful way. For your own use, when you start to use this worksheet, Again, remember to make a copy of it for yourself because you only have read access to this document. But once you make your own copy, you can now start to customize it. Of course, you're not going to study freshman, sophomore, junior, seniors. You're going to study tree farms of different things or otters or whatever my goofy homework questions are. But, right, you can make more categories. You just insert a category on the left. And look, now I have five, boom. Right, and now there's five categories. You do want to check to make sure your sums uh, work the right way when you're summing across. Make sure your rectangles include all the points. If you add columns in the middle, it almost always does it right. If you add one on the right or left, sometimes it leaves it out. That's more a spreadsheet issue than a statistics issue. And similarly, if you want to delete and only have three categories, you can just delete a column 
Although if you do that, watch that you don't delete your confidence interval, your pretty version at the bottom. Okay, so you can uh, use this to pretty much solve all your things. I'd recommend making a new worksheet for each uh, question that you have to answer. So just even keep this one maybe pretty, right? Keep it perfect because you worry about messing it up. And so you just duplicate it and get a copy of it for each problem. And then you can go in and work it through. This idea, I think for some of you, is going to be uncomfortable because it's fuzzy. And already the first homework, you had a little bit of that, well, you didn't tell me what confidence level to use. And, you know, when we can say, oh, when you don't get one, use 95%, but you still feel like, am I just making up stuff? And yes, is the short answer. You are just making up stuff, but that's really the way statistics works when you're actually doing it. This idea that your boss is going to say, now you be sure to use 95, you know, they're not going to tell you stuff like that. And so the idea that you use 95% unless there's a reason not to. Even that idea on that first question on the homework about making the sheet, right? The formula I gave you was for alpha over two and the little chart was for alpha. That's really annoying, right? And in fact, teaching SAT 190, that's really annoying that we teach alpha over two, but the chart has alpha. When I interviewed for a job here in 1999, I totally messed that up in my lecture, like the one that we're gonna see as a candidate. But when they pointed out I did the sheet wrong, I immediately had to redo my lecture. So my notes were saying one thing and I had to say something else and they hired me. So I must not have sucked at it too badly. Although Dr. Guppy just retired, so you can't ask him anymore how much I suck. Um, but this idea that we got to kind of fiddle with it on the fly, you got to kind of read it. The reason I gave you those couple numbers for the table is so you can say, oh, my columns are off. I'm going to have to scooch it over. Do you want to change the name of the column to be alpha over two instead of alpha? Well, you could do that, but if the, what they want is alpha, then you got to make it alpha. And how you adjust that really is kind of left to you. And so in non-parametric statistics, even more than in traditional statistics and open regression, this, oh, uh, what's the best we can make it do? It's really a skill that you, you'll develop in the course and that I hope you develop more broadly. And you remember even that example we did on the first day about uh, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? You sort of work out the p-value on the fly by just thinking about how the problem works out and how it's explained. Um, we're going to do some more stuff with that later with combinations. So this idea that you have the stratified worksheet, you're going to, you know, wrap it with a hammer until it does what you need it to do. Don't actually wrap it with a hammer because the monitor will break. But this idea that you kind of have to fiddle with it, this builds in the 95% confidence if you want to make it 90. You have to do that. One change for those of you more used to Excel is that in Excel you would put 0.9, but here if you do that, that's going to be 0.9% instead of 90%, and that'll totally confuse you as well. Okay, so all that stuff, again, the fact that it spits out this 1.96, that's a good sign because we know that for 95% confidence intervals, 1.96 is usually the number for that. Is that a two-sided or one-sided? Just making that, you're making that chart right now for your homework, right? Yeah, Two-sided. Okay, so that sort of stuff is annoying. So sorry in advance, although not sorry because it makes you stronger. You will be better able to crush your foes in the future. All right, so that's how we do means. Similar though is proportions. And we had the simple formula for proportions confidence intervals before, confidence interval for a true proportion is equal to our sample proportion plus or minus z times the square root of p, 1 minus p over n. And when we added in the correction and the complication to make it stratified, right, of course, p, uh, no, our confidence interval for p is equal to P hat stratified plus or minus Z times P hat stratified, one minus P hat stratified all over N, which we have to plug in the formulas for that. And I don't think I wrote those formulas last class, but P hat stratified is again this idea of a weighted average. So if your group is 58% right, women, you would weight however many women you happen to get in the sample 
5.58 and then 42 percent uh, for men if you only have two genders in your data set. Right, what's a little different is once you've done that, you're sort of done because you don't, right, standard deviation of uh, proportion still uses that same number. So now you just plug that in everywhere it goes. The N sub J's does get added in as well. So the formula for P is now equal to the sum of the W sub J's times P sub J and hat. Right, and J still goes from one to L, the number of layers you have, plus or minus your Z score. Of course, Z is actually nicer because it doesn't depend on um, degrees of freedom, so you don't have to worry about your sample size. Times the square root of the sum of P sub J hat, one minus P hat J over NJ. And then if you do include the finite population correction, one minus n sub j over big N sub j just gets stuck in there. Again, arithmetically, right, no fun at all. I couldn't write it last class correctly, but certainly if you had to do this for a whole bunch of samples, you would really worry about making technical mistakes, which is why it's nice that the spreadsheet will do it for you. Okay, so we were using the mean tab in class last time. We're gonna use the proportion tab right now. So this is actually the same question, but now we're counting the number of people who reported they don't drink at all. So a success in the binomial sense means that they reported in an average drink, in an average week, they drink zero drinks per week. Okay, so that's, you can argue whether that's a success, but that's a different thing. But for this case, the idea that that's why they write a success, you just label what it is. One interesting thing is you look at just how the sample data works. Even though we reported that freshmen drank less than juniors, on average, 23 of the 42 juniors said they didn't drink at all. And so the proportion who don't drink at all is much higher, which is sort of counterintuitive. But also remember, that that confidence interval is going to have a huge span. So in fact, this one almost totally covers the other spans because right with proportions or confidence intervals a lot wider. So our simple random sample p hat was that 40% of students don't drink at all. And our stratified one was 42% of students said on average they don't drink at all. Notice that that's different than reporting that you never drink, right? So people who would have a religious or health objection to drinking. This is rather that they report on average they don't drink in a typical week, right? And that's a slightly different, right? Your average can round to zero, which is not the same as you never ever do something. So our data is that about 30 some percent of students report they don't drink at all ever, but this is a slightly higher number than that. All right, so math, 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 algebra, 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 arithmetic, woo! Again, our uh, sampling fraction is what percent of each group we sampled. Notice here our, uh, we had 19% of the freshmen in the study, but only 4% of the juniors in the study. FPC is one minus that. Multiply, multiply, square root, square root. Standard error, margin of error, and you get this overall proportion. Notice that because the junior class was so small in their response that that's plus or minus 15 percent. So if I said hey between 40 and 70 percent you would probably not be impressed with my prediction skills because you know that's a giant gap that probably without collecting data you probably would have gotten somewhere. I guess it's maybe it's a little higher of students who said they don't drink at all. I mean, it's a little higher than you would have guessed, but the fact that that's so wide uh, makes it uh, sort of interesting. And again, the freshman one is plus or minus five, right? To say between 34 and 43 and a half percent, that's much more useful. And that's not unusual that when you do a study, you would get results like this. Now, literally the reason why I was asked to do this analysis 15 years ago is because people were worried that this post-strata, this 
lack of stratification because they were just reporting this number, the simple random sample number. And they were using this to say, huh, who knew 40% of students don't drink at all. And people were saying, student government among them, hey, maybe that's not really true because you have so few seniors and juniors in your study. I wonder if there's a way to adjust for that and to take it into account. Dean Gilchrist, who was the Dean of Students back then, she was retired last year, two years ago. Um, she asked if I could help and I literally teach that class. So um, I helped her out and I did this analysis and said, well, you know, it moves a little bit, but your overall claim that a big chunk of students typically don't drink is still true. That, and again, the fact that students in self-reports when you asked how other students drink are horrible at predicting that because you tend to assume that the campus is like your particular friend group. So it might be higher or lower depending on who you know. But actually very few students actually had any idea that it was 40%. That most guesses were either 10% or 70%. And you know, how it goes. Um, so this idea though that you're using the stratified formula to just make these kind of educated guesses that are slightly more educated than lumping them all together. That's really the driving force behind doing this sort of stratified analysis. All right, those other two tabs we're gonna do next week because that's the third homework assignment. So don't, don't fret that you haven't gotten to them yet. All right. All right, so if we go to 538. So 538.com, some of you we were talking about it before class. 538 is a statistics website. Their two main avenues are politics and sports. Um, depending on who you ask, one of those is controversial. Maybe two of them are controversial to most people. Um, but what they're really about is about taking survey data, taking other kind of evidence, and putting it together to make models. So each dot in this chart is one survey about uh, the presidential approval or disapproval rate. And again, this isn't a class about politics specifically, but certainly if you look from <coughs> inauguration day on, what percent of people approve or disapprove of the president, you can see, yeah, it kind of works out that um, it changes over time. There are certainly some big trends going on. This is where the government shutdown happened, right here. And you can see that um, the president's disapproval rating went up during that month that the government was shut down and his approval rating went down. These don't quite add up to 100% because you can say don't know or I don't you know. So it seems rare to most people to think that you would neither approve nor disapprove of the president, but um, you are allowed to do that. And about 2% of people typically do that. Um, anyway, without doing too much, math, it's easy to see that these rates are going up, right? This, this rate went up over the last month. And in fact, it leveled off in the last few days since the, the deal to keep the, to reopen the government was reached, right? And so the question is, well, how do you make this line and this bar? This is literally a confidence interval around this bar, okay? This is literally a stratified, he's exactly, uh, Nate Silver and his people are literally using our formula, I'm sure they have a prettier version of it, and it's in their font that they always use, but they're literally just producing a stratified sample. And you might say, well, gosh, how, how would you do that? Look how many polls, there's a ton of polls, and in fact, if you scroll down, you can see all the polls there are. Most polls are done in over a couple day span. Here's all your different pollsters. And they're done in different things. Quinnipiac University and Monmouth University both have polling centers there. If you want to donate $10 million to Truman, we'll have a polling center too. Um, they have ratings. They have a sample based off uh, how many people they asked in the study. Notice most of them are about 1,000. Harris Interactive is a little bit different. Harris Interactive uses a panel. So you actually have people uh, who sign up to work for Harris International. If you do that, you'll get like coupons and gift cards and stuff, and you fill out surveys. And they then post stratify the surveys based off of who's in their study. So it's not that they say, oh, we need to have a certain number of 18 to 25 year olds. In fact, they say, come on in and fill out our survey. But they weigh it saying 18 to 25 year olds are more likely to do their survey. Uh, you know, Latino voters age 60 and up 
our dish proportions, so they exactly use our stratified methods to adjust it this way. So Harris does that themselves. Then 538 gives each poll a weight based off how reliable it is and how long ago it was. So rather than just saying we're going to use polls in the last two weeks, what they do is they say the longer back it is, the less polls are weighed in. And you can see going all the way back here, um, but not all the way back, just all back, back three weeks. You can see how all the various surveys are here. Notice that it's thousands and thousands of people, with the idea being that each particular survey of a thousand people is probably flawed in the ways that it's flawed, but there should be some way to smush them together in a way that makes them more meaningful than any of the individual polls. Right? So, pretty straightforward. And again, the math they're doing is pretty straightforward. They're actually using an extra technique, which we call Bayesian statistics. We have a class in that that adds in some extra things about that because this weight isn't just categories like we're doing, but it's linear based off this value of how much we trust it. But between them, you can kind of see how all these little dots fit together to make a single number and a confidence band around it, which is this orange range. Okay. Similar, there are two different kind of polls that are usually done. One is of people who are likely voters or registered voters, and another one is of all people. Of course, depending what you're doing, right? Sometimes what you're asking about is, is the president going to get reelected? Well, then caring about people who vote is the important thing. If you just want to know for all people, and we can see how the polls are a little bit different when you do that. They're actually not as different as you might think they're within a couple percent of each other. And of course, they have pretty graphs and stuff to do all those things. Are there outliers? Sure. There's a dot up here with a 70% disapproval rating. There's some here where the approval rating is outside of the confidence band. But overall, this technique, which again is not any more, compl not any more complicated than what we just did, really shows you sort of the magic of this. And you might say, well, that's cool, but show me the same thing on something important. And you can see that that's how they do predictions for uh, basketball games, for soccer games, um, for economic predictions, um, and um, just different things like that. So this idea that even with this technique, which is not to, again, arithmetically, it's a pain in the butt. If you have to do these by hand, you will wish that you had not had to do them by hand. And in this class, we're not doing any at all by hand. So the fact that I forgot to write the little two on the formula yesterday, or the Tuesday, is bad, I'm sorry. But it doesn't actually matter because the computer is going to do all the arithmetic for us. Um, so we can uh, really just take this from here. All right, so here's another survey. And so this is a survey I did in a class um, not too long ago. Where's the one I want? Here it is, okay. So this is a survey about uh, scholarship hours, it was done by um, this class, the big project is now not in this class anymore, um, but this was done in um, 2013. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So it asked people about, are you currently or have you had to do scholarship hours before, right? So that's an interesting enough thing to look at. And the data we actually have okay, so these are just. A one if you've done scholarship hours and a two if you haven't. And you can see that actually most people in the study have done scholarship hours. Um, and the reason for that is that this was actually specifically targeted at people who had done scholarship hours. So the fact is out of the whatever they had 100 some people in their responses, 180 some, if I do count if
I have 36 people who said they haven't done scholarship hours and 142 who have. So overall, that's a sample size of that many. I guess I could figure that out. Right, or a proportion of 36 out of 178. So 20% of the respondents had not done scholarship hours. Okay, so once we get data like that, we could use that to make our analysis. We could also look, I should have froze the top panel so we could see these. Um, we could look at their year in school to do the same sorts of things. And actually, let me just open this. SPSS file is probably easier to get these averages and stuff. So we're looking at year in school and we're looking at whether or not they've done scholarship hours and we'll get uh, not that one, but kind of like observed and we want to get Broke, so let's do just numbers first. So we do that, and so you can see out of the different ages, right, uh, people in their first year are very unlikely to report it having done scholarship hours. Why is that? Good, right, because they don't have to do scholarship hours. So how's that going to mess us up on our other questions? In fact, of the 36 people who don't have scholarship hours, 18 of them are freshmen, so that's going to really kind of mangle up our study. And so you might even say, well, let's just leave the freshmen out of the study because, right, what do they know about scholarship hours? Silly freshmen. Notice that of the juniors and seniors, almost all of them have done scholarship hours. And in fact, if we do turn this into a percent, oh. Right, so 95% of the freshmen have not had scholarship hours, which isn't surprising. And 80% of the sophomores haven't done scholarship, or 80% have and 20% haven't. And then of the upper people, most all of them have. Why do you think sophomores are 80% yes and 20% no? Everybody who was surveyed had a scholarship because some people come in with sophomore status, right? Because sophomore isn't about how long you've been on campus and how many credit hours you have. So, trick question. Okay, so. Go back to the survey. So the actual question we might want to care about, right, are these other things. But probably we care about these questions that ask them about the actual details of their scholarship position. Right? Um, you'll be happy to know the result of this survey was that True Positions was created, that place where you go look for jobs. So again, yay campus surveys that actually make a difference to the world. Um, and it also was when they added in the gradation. Before that, if you had a 325, you kept your scholarship, and below a 325, you lost your scholarship totally. And so now it's a stepped thing, which should make you slightly less stressed about your scholarship. If you have one of those. Um, and as we look at these answers, so this is 13. D. So 13D is I would prefer to do less scholarship and receive less scholarship money. Oops, I don't check the other one. Right, you can see, and again, it's a little hard to see maybe from, your, from far back, but that 
only a handful of people said I would be happier to get less money if I could do fewer scholarship hours. And most everyone, a majority of people strongly disagreed, except among the fifth year uh, students. And remember, there were only a handful of fifth year students, nine. I guess you can tell it's nine because they're all one, one, one for that. Okay, so we could look at this data. Go back here to our chart. Yes, I know Adobe School. We can look here at our same formula. Look at our output. There we go. So 60%, 54. The overall was 59%. Well, I guess that would count. I don't want percent, that would count. That's right. Remember, I changed it from counts to row percent. That doesn't help me. There we go. So, fifteen, forty-eight, fifty. That's combined seniors and super seniors, 58. And then 9, 26, 32, 34. Our overall percent was 59%. Our adjusted percent is 59 and a quarter percent. Right, that was a lot of work for not very much difference. We did get a difference between uh, the ages, but not very much. We could run this by whether or not they've had scholarship hours or not. Remember, most of them were freshmen. But we can see not too much difference. Now, one thing is I didn't change these capital Ns. So this was actually the student body distribution in 2004. And this data was not from 2004, it's from so 2009 is when we got it. Oh, that one changed because I have it open right now. Right? Um, so that was five years off. The fact that our ends are off by five years, what do you think of that? Am I a bad man? You've already come to that. It's only like the third week of class. Most people take longer. You're moving your heads in opposite directions, which is good. So, so why is this bad? Now you were. Oh, it was not accurate. Just wrong. Okay. Some of you are going, eh, probably fine. Why are you saying that? Okay. You changed your mind. You're not willing to. You. No one's going to stand up for my questionable. Statistical decisions. Emoji shrug. Yeah, go ahead. I feel like the distribution of students by wouldn't change significantly over time. Yeah, right, emoji shrug is your answer, I think. Yeah. Right, right, year to year, there's probably not a ton of difference. Also, right, for this data set, we actually could go and get the real data because, right, we literally have a registrar's office that tracks this stuff. But for lots of things, we don't take readings all that often, right? If you're looking at your customer data, you know, how, what, what ages are your customers? Typically, those aren't done very frequently. Um, so it might be this is lousy, but it's better than the nothing you'd have otherwise. Um, we can see here, here's our Sampling fraction, right? We got 4% of the other ages and 1% of freshmen, according to this. This would have been about five years out of date. 
a little bit icky. We've actually had the biggest swings in the last two years. That right, two years ago the class was extra big, and last year the class was extra small. That was the largest single year change in freshman and sophomore classes that we've seen. So maybe now it would be worse. Back then our enrollment was more stable. Although 2009 would have been a weird, right? That was the year right after the financial crash. Yeah, so even if it's normally okay, 2008-9. 2009 was actually a great recruiting year for us because we're cheap. So if you lost all your stock investments, come to Truman. Um, but, uh, but either way, I imagine the way people would have like well, that's exactly right. So all we have from 2004 are these big ends. So we don't know anything about what they think about scholarship hours. We do know in 2009, people extra didn't want to lose their scholarships, although that was probably true in 2004 as well. Probably true in 2019, if you'd like to keep your scholarships. You don't have to do stupid work to do that. So, I mean, I was joking about it, but sort of the answer to this really is emoji shrug, that you'd like to have the best data about your population you could, but the overall decision is, are you more confident in the capital W's or in the little w's? Here are little w's, which, where is that? I mean, we can figure it out, I guess, right? This out of 171. Right, that's not too bad, except that it really does undercount freshmen. So the extent of doing the stratified sampling really would be to overweigh those freshman responses. Maybe that's the opposite of year one, because five minutes ago you said, well, they hadn't done scholarship hours anyway, so screw them. We don't have any freshmen, so we can make fun of them all we want. No, it's not nice to be. Yeah, go ahead. So the numbers for the population size, that's yep. like, 2018 or 2019? No, that's 2004 because it's because it's right. I literally just kept it from that core okay. survey. So okay. in 2004, when I did this survey, those are the numbers we had. In fact, today there's 300 fewer students. We only have 5,100. Right, that's why we're in a crisis and we're freaking out about enrollment. Um, but in 2004, that was the numbers we had. Uh, so yeah, spring 2004 those numbers are as accurate as the registrar could give us. What we just did was we just stuck that N and that number sign from this data, this data, which came from 2009 for this survey. And I think, again, my argument that the data is okay, and Natalie's argument that I'm full of crap and I should quit it, are both valid. Right, and again, that's this idea of this uncertainty. And one of the things that makes us most uncomfortable in statistics is not uncertainty, because that's literally what we do, right? We're all about, we love us some uncertainty. That's why I get paid. But the uncertainty that we are so uncertain about, we can't even estimate the way that we're not certain, that really makes us worry. Uncertainty that has a structure to it, uncertainty that has, um, some sense of what's going on. We love that. That's where we live. That's where we dance. But this going, well, how much different is it if we use numbers that are five years out of date? The US census only happens every 10 years. The sign as you drive into Kirksville says, welcome to Kirksville, 17,000 people. We actually have about 21,000 people. In fact, people are arguing over where it would be, the 19.5 to 21.5 is where they think it's going to be here, right? So we added a dental school in the last 10 years, craft plants expanded several hundred jobs. But we only update that sign every decade because we do it off the census. Also, we're cheap, so we don't want to pay for a new sign all the time. Right, so if you use that number, if I go to Wikipedia, that's the number I'm going to get. Oops, not that one. No, back a little. There you go. There you go. 17,505. I think that's literally what's on the sign. A lot of people. 
a beautiful picture of her downtown. That's like the worst picture you right? That's, there are many beautiful things you can take a picture of in Kirksville. That's, uh, that's uh, right, I just walked out of Polly Eyes and ate too much and that's the picture I would take. In the 2000 census, there were 16,988. In the 2010, there were 17,505. That's a difference of what, not very much, 3%. It's estimated in 2016 that we got 14 extra people. And like I said, since then, that's when, right, when the craft plant expanded and the dental school opened. So we actually think it's gone up. So next year, we're going to do a census, right? This is 19 and next year is 20. Are you going to count in the census? You're a human. Some of you hope to graduate and be gone. It's not in April. So will you be here in April a year from now? Lots of you will. Will we count the <laughs> Funny question, will you? It depends on how you fill out the form. Typically, if you read the form, it says if your permanent residence is here, then you would. So if you still live at your mom's house, then you should count there. And in fact, they do actually a little bit of control to make sure you don't put it down both. Right? The government doesn't actually care which one you list as long as you don't put down two. They care if you're a resident, so those of you who aren't citizens, you would still count if your American address is here in lovely Kirksville. Those of you who have your own address and you pay an electric bill, the census tells you that that would be a sign that you're a resident in Kirksville and not a resident in wherever your family lives. So if you live on campus, probably you're not. Um, in 2010, it counted about almost exactly half of our students said they lived in Kirksville and half of them said they lived somewhere else. Because even if you say you don't live here, you still have to send the form back. And there's a fine, although no one ever gets charged the fine if you, if you don't. Or worse than that, they knock on your door and try to talk to you in person. And I know you don't want that. In fact, they're going to hire people next year for that. There's totally a job you could do. It's crap. They pay cash. I guess if the government operation. Um, the other thing that's happened in Kirksville in the last few years is we've had the Congolese immigrants come. And some of you know more about that than others. In fact, there's a study of that. Um, <clears throat> hey, students and faculty from Truman State University took that. I bet we edited that Wikipedia page. That totally looks like us writing that. It's actually more than, by February 16, it was 40 Congolese, now it's over 200 families, which is about uh, 500 people. So again, that's another reason we think the population is going to go up. All of them will count as residents because it asks where your U.S. residence is, so even if they still Imagine they're going to go back to Congo once the troubles are over, which isn't soon. They would still count because this is their U.S. home. By the way, the record low in Kirksville is uh, minus 23, so we didn't break the record yesterday. Sorry. I know you were looking forward to that. Um, and it's been 70 in January. All right, so I tell you all this not because it's super interesting to think about Kirksville population, although it is interesting to think about Kirksville population. Um, so this idea, though, that we tend to think about these NJs and the counts, right? That's what we get from our data, and that's where we want to think about our our work, but it turns out that top line, which in our first case, which was we took the data from the registrar, so it's correct, it turns out that's actually a pretty tricky thing as well. So you can imagine the same thing applying for customers. Um, do we know what our customers buy? I guess we know what products we sell, but that's different than knowing from who buys them. If we think about health data, do we have evidence that we believe? Right? In fact, one reason a lot of statisticians were really worried about the government shutdown is that the end of the year is when we do a lot of that kind of data collection. They go to hospitals and they get their annual records from the hospitals. And of course, that didn't happen while the government was shutting down. So now they're trying to catch up and now they're kind of, you know, a whole month off for that. And typically that's when they would go and they would get the whole year's worth of data. So 
that idea that, that we would go to the government database to get those capital ends and they don't have it, that actually scares us a fair bit because we really like having good population numbers to work from. But even so, this question of, eh, how bad is bad enough that we are not going to do it? And so that question that comes back to is the one we talked about. Stratified random sampling is awesome when capital W's have more confidence than the lowercase w's. And no amount of statistics, no amount of mathematics is going to help you with that. Right? Sometimes you'll go and do a second survey to just try to do a population count. Um, that's especially true in ecology, right? Ecology is sort of famous for caring about counts of things. How many manatees are there is a question, right? Whereas we're less interested in how many there are than in what the percent of them do or how they respond in most statistics. But in ecology, that population count is actually super important. And um, all right, so remember to put this all back. <coughs> All right, some of you haven't downloaded it yet. Okay, so this worksheet is handy and you're going to probably want to use it. So that's sort of the end of what we need to know to do sampling homework number two. And we have just a few minutes left. So questions like these, some of them are based off the questions you did last time. But this idea that typically we want to work the sample out both ways. So we'll do both a stratified random sample and a simple random sample and see how different it is. There's your tree data, your otter data. We'll come back again. Okay. But I think you can go ahead and um, do that homework now. So you can do that whenever you want. All right. So I have a couple um, minutes left. Um, I think I'm going to stop early because it's still cold. This is a pretty full set of stuff. So all you have for this section, though, is that Google Sheets, you want to understand what the formula is doing, you want to understand how we're smushing those formulas together. If you want to see the mathematics, remember we don't have a textbook, but you can do the Wikipedia page, which I know sounds kind of unsatisfying, but you didn't have to buy a book, so enjoy Wikipedia, right? So the zero dollars you paid is a great resource, um, and so you should go ahead and use that. Okay, so I will email, I'm going to go to my office right now, I'm going to email you about the candidates coming, and again, you should come to that if you can, and you'd like to, for your five points. Um, homework number one is due today. You have 20 minutes. You can work on it right now. Um, next week, we're going to start talking about some fancier kinds of sampling. And we're also going to start um, talking about the project we're going to do this semester. <clears throat> These three homeworks is the whole first exam. That's all it's going to cover. Um, and it's going to be a pretty, uh, it's a pretty simple exam because it's really going to be Here's a simple sample. Here's a stratified sample. Here's one more. So if you can understand how to do this stratified, you should be all set for this first exam. It's in like three weeks, although with the way the schedules are, I'm going to check to see what date I actually had it scheduled for. Who knows, who knows when anything's happening right now in Truman. Um, and assuming we're not having another blizzard. Yeah, so who knows what we're doing. So, all right, so have a great rest of your day. And if you can come tomorrow, that'd be awesome. Monday, there's another candidate. If you come to, so before our next class, we have two candidates in person. One's going to have one season and one's going to have a totally different season. So, all right, see ya.